So I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles, if you would, and find your way to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, as we, as we continue in our series in 2 Corinthians, in a, in, a, in a series that's called God's Strength and Our Weakness. And certainly as moms, you understand that. If you don't have a Bible, I'd encourage you to grab one of the black Bibles in front of you and you can find 2 Corinthians on page 909. One of the core distinctives of our church is bold preaching with a commitment to biblical exposition. It's preaching the word of God without apology. It's verse by verse exposition, exegesis. And when I say preaching the word of God without apology, this is the word of God. This is God's word to us. God wrote a book. And we trust and believe in authorial intent, meaning God wrote it, God meant something, and that's what we want to understand. It's like if you were to write a letter to a friend, you would want them to read that letter and understand that letter in the way in which you wrote it to them. You don't want them to, oh, I think I'm just going to put my own spin on this and interpret it differently than what you had meant and as part of uh, our commitment to biblical exposition, we go verse by verse through the Bible. We don't skip over passages. So when I was looking at my preaching calendar, and I saw that on Mother's Day, May 12th, we were going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I'm thinking, I can't preach that on, on Mother's Day. That's, that's a passage on giving. Like, why would I do that? But then, as I, more I read the text, I realized that the principles for giving really speak a lot about what it means to be a mother. It's being generous. It's being sacrificial. It's being joyful. It's, it's understanding the importance of, of being loving and glorifying God and enriching. And when you look at both 1 Corinthians 16 and 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, that's really what the text speaks of with regard to giving. Well, 2 Corinthians 8 is about gospel-motivated generosity. And so that's what this message is about. I want to say, if you're a guest today, you'll know, and for those of you that are regulars, we rarely speak about giving. God has been gracious. He's used our church. They give with a gracious heart. But it's interesting because over 2,350 verses in the Bible are on money and possessions. Jesus talks about money and possessions more than almost any other subject in the Bible. That's why it's important that we talk about it. Because ultimately, it's a heart issue. And sometimes we don't want to hear it because it's an issue of our own hearts. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is the most concentrated text in the Bible on giving. Here's what's un important to understand. God doesn't, one, need your money. God owns a, th thousand ca a cattle on a thousand hills. Everything we have is from him. God doesn't want your money. He wants our hearts. And ultimately, that's one of the most important things for us to understand. And your giving is a response to a heart that's been transformed by the gospel. In fact, let me give you the big idea of the message. Generosity is a Christian's response to God's generous act of grace. The gospel of Jesus Christ is an act of grace. In fact, if you look at verse 9, you will see that. We'll get there in a minute, but I'm just going to read it real quick. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might be rich. Jesus left the glory of heaven. He condescended, became a man, lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death on the cross in your place, totally impoverished, 
And that by his poverty, you might become rich. You might become, receive the riches of grace. And so that's why I say generosity is a Christian's response to God's generous act of grace. Because when we understand what Christ has done for us, it changes how we live. It changes how we love. And certainly it should change how we give. Let's look at chapter 8, starting, chapter eight, starting in verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also." So we learn some lessons on generosity. And this is really a, a, a message about generosity. We learn some, some, some lessons on generosity. First of all, generosity is an act of grace. So what's going on in this text? What's the context? Well, in the ancient world, the land known as Israel today, Judea, they would go through severe famines. And for many Christians who had converted, they may have lost their jobs. So you had, you had an issue for a lot of, lot of these people that they would either lose jobs or because there was a famine, they were in great need. And so Paul would take up a collection to take back to those in Judea to help them meet their needs. There were churches in Macedonia and Achaia and Galatia that desire to contribute. In fact, let me put up Romans chapter 15. Paul says this, at present, however, he wrote this to the Romans, I am going to Jerusalem, bring aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. So there's this, there's this gift that is being brought to those in need in Jerusalem. In fact, if you look back at chapter at chapters of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1, it gives you a little more insight. So just turn back a couple pages to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 1. Paul says to the church in Corinth in this letter, he says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, same concept. As I directed the churches of Galatia, so in Romans, he talked about Macedonia and Achaia. Here he talks about Galatia. So you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Now, let me just put up a map real quick. And if you can see on this screen, here's Judea. Here's Jerusalem down here. And this is a picture of Paul's first, second, and third missionary journeys. Here is Galatia over here. This is Galatia. It's where Iconium, uh, Lystra, Derby, and uh, um, uh, Antioch are. Up here is Macedonia. And Macedonia is where Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea are. And here's Corinth. This is Achaia. So these are the regions that Paul is talking about. And these, these areas of Galatia, Macedonia, and Achaia were to, to, to create a, a fund, if you will, and they were going to collect it and take it back to Judea to help those people. So when you look back at, at, at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, he says, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Now, notice what it says here, the grace of God. There's something about this gift, and he calls it the grace of God. In fact, you see it over and over in, in this text. In fact, 
Down in verse 6, he calls it this act of grace. In verse 7, he calls it this act of grace. Verse 9, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is grace? Grace is receiving something we don't deserve. We can speak of that as our salvation. Our salvation we do not deserve, but it's God's gift. He says, this is God's grace. This gift that they were giving was considered an act of grace because it was in response to God's grace towards them. Now, when you read these texts, both in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, certainly it's about a specific offering. But what we get out of these texts are great principles for giving. We get a New Testament pattern for grace giving. So let me go through those with you. First of all, it's systematic. It's systematic. In fact, we see in, we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, it says, he said on, um, in verse 2, he says, on the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside to store it up. So it was systematic. Each on the, on the first day of the week. When was the first day of the week? Well, the first day of the week is the Lord's day. It's the day that Jesus arose from the dead. The Jews, their Sabbath was on Saturday. But ever since the resurrection, we've celebrated the Lord on the, on the resurrection day, the Lord's day. And so it, it's systematic. Now, some people say that means I have to do it every week. Well, no. The, the, the pattern is it could be weekly. It could be bimonthly. It could be monthly doesn't have to be each week. For Pam and I, we get paid by the church on the 1st and the 15th. So we've set up automatic giving to go away, to go to the church on the 1st and the 15th. If, if Pam does a real estate deal, that would be the first check that would be, be written to the church. Because we understand that all that we have, all that has been provided to us is from the Lord. And we've, we learned that early on as Christians. That was something that was really taught a lot. And so notice he says in chapter 16, verse one, each of you. Now who's included in each of you? (laughs) All of us. There's an expectation when Paul is saying to the church in uh, Corinth, now each of you lay something aside. It wasn't just for the few. It was for everybody. Why? Because it's a grace. It's an opportunity to bless others. And if our hearts have been transformed by what Christ has done for us, then we should, we should want as an overflow of what Christ has done for us to give to one another. Paul expected everyone to give. I think part of this as parents, it's a reminder that we should teach our children early on the importance of giving, the importance of the fact that like when, if they get an allowance or if they work... God is the one that gave them the ability to work. God is the one that gave them an opportunity to even receive an allowance. And so what what we want to do is teach them the importance of giving back a portion of that to the Lord as as an offering, as a sacrifice of praise. Help them understand that you're investing in eternity by laying up treasures in heaven. So it's systematic. But secondly, it's proportionate. I think this is very important. In fact, in chapter uh, two of, of uh, excuse me, in chapter 16 of first Corinthians, he says on the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, as he may prosper. It, it's going to be different for everyone. Like it's not going to be, this is not where equality comes in. It's as you prosper. And I think it's important to say it's not equal giving, but equal participation as you prosper. But here's the problem. Some people will say, well, when I make more, then I will give. You know what's wrong with that reasoning? (laughs) Is you could continue that reasoning on and on and on because you make more, you buy buy a house or you get a new car and then you have more expenses. And, and so what you're doing is you're not making a, it a priority in your life. See, God wants us to be faithful with the little things. Some people might ask, well, what about the tithe? So what about the tithe? The tithe is one tenth. The tithe is from the Old Testament. But actually, the tithe came before even the law. 
And you see that with Abraham and Melchizedek, where he gave 10% to Melchizedek, Abraham did, who was both a priest and king. But actually, in the Old Testament, there were three tithes. There was 10% that went to the temple. There was 10% that went to those that served in the temple. And then every three years, there was 10% that was given for widows and orphans, which would average out to about 23%. But the New Testament does not, it doesn't specify a percentage. And I think that's really important. But nowhere does the New Testament abolish the tithe. But one of the things I've learned to, over the years is why give less under grace than you would under the law? Randy Alcorn says the tithe should probably be the floor, not the ceiling. And he says that in his book, uh, Treasure Principle, which is really good. So it's systematic. It's proportionate. It's joyful. It's joyful. Back in chapter 8, verse, verse 2, notice what he says. He says, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy. There was, a, there was joy in being able to give to the work of helping those that were in need. I'm telling you, there should be joy for us knowing that our giving helps to advance the gospel, that more people are saved as a result of our being able to give and, and to, to provide for others. It says abundance of joy. There was a, a surplus. It was an overflow. They rose above their circumstances due to their love and appreciation of the Lord. In fact, chapter 9, verse 7 says, God loves a cheerful giver. And in fact, that word cheerful, it's, it's, all, it's also known as, it's translated hilarious. Hilarious giver. I know one church that, it's kind of weird. When they would do their offering and pass the plates, we don't do that. They said, okay, everybody, we want you to kind of laugh hysterically. That's weird. <laughs> it's a heart thing, okay? It should be a heart thing. Not only is it joyful, but it's generous. Look again at chapter 8, verse 2. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme pro uh, poverty overflowed, here it is, in a wealth of generosity on their part. It was generous. There was nothing stingy about these believers. That word overflow, it's like a river overflowing its banks. Generous, the word means single-mindedness. It's a, it's a focus on others. There, there was a generosity with them. They felt it. They were giving in response to God's grace. But not only that, it's sacrificial. It's sacrificial. Look again, let me start in verse 2. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, that's proportionate, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, it was willing, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, this was unexpected to Paul. But they gave themselves first to the Lord, really important. They gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Now, the language in this passage is pretty intense. In a severe test of affliction, out of extreme poverty, yet there was a wealth of generosity the fact is, they felt it, but they were giving in response to God's grace. We see back in verse, in, again in verse 9, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord. It all kind of flows into that verse. They saw it as a privilege. You could see that in verse 4. Begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. They saw it as a privilege to be able to give. They... they, they there was an earnestness, and, and you see something in verse 5. I, I kind of hit on this. They gave themselves first to the Lord. And I mean this. We as a church don't care about your money. But we care that your heart is given to the Lord. That's kind of the way Johannes was leading us this morning. Because when we give our hearts to the Lord, 
It changes how we parent. It changes how we love our spouse. It changes how we serve. It changes how we sacrifice. It changes our desire to grow in the Lord. When we give ourselves to the Lord, when we say, Lord, I'm yours. We become a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. Then money's never an issue. Because we want to give out an overflow of our hearts. Their dedication to the Lord led to giving sacrificially as a response to God's grace. Look at verse 6. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. And verse 7 is a verse that has really never hit me like it did this week. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace. Like, there's a lot of us that we're praying, Lord, deepen my faith. You know, we, we, we think about the spiritual disciplines and, and, and we think about wanting to grow in our knowledge and our earnestness and our love for the Lord and our speech. And we want to excel in those things. These are spiritual disciplines. Paul is saying, just as you want to excel in those, see that you excel in this act of grace. God, help me to be a better giver. And see, the opposite of being a giver is a taker. And that's, that should be the heart of the church. I'm not just talking about hope, but the big C church. We should be about giving of ourselves for the kingdom. Why? Because of what Christ has done for us in response to our salvation, which we didn't earn, which we don't deserve but was also an act of grace. And you may look at verse 7, you may think, okay, it's kind of weird how it's the worded here. It says, but as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge, in all earnestness and our love for you, but actually there's a textual note there, and I think it says down below, it says some manuscripts state in your love for us, and I just feel like that makes more sense there. As you grow in your love for us versus our love for you. See that you excel in this act of grace. All right. Generosity, it's an act of grace. If you have a generous heart, it's an act of grace. Well, secondly, we learn that generosity is a response to the gospel. Generosity is a response to the gospel. It should be a response to the gospel for sure. Look at verse 8. I say this not as a command. You know, it's funny. You, you can't command generosity because if you're commanding generosity, it's not generous. It's compelling. You know, like I'm, we're compelling. You're like, that's not generous. It's, once again, it's an inside out thing. It's something that is caused by your heart being transformed. He says, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. It's a, it's a picture of your love and the, the love that's been given to you by Christ. And then he says, for, there's the conjunction, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Your grace Generosity is a response to the gospel. It's a, it's a picture of your love. A love that's a result of the gospel, which we see verse 9 is the gospel in a verse. If you, that'd be a great verse to mark in your Bible, to memorize. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, what does he mean rich? Jesus sat at he, he was in heaven with the Father. He had all the riches of heaven. And he laid aside his royal robes, all the riches of heaven. He condescended to become a man, born of a virgin, born under the law to redeem man back to himself. He who was rich became poor. Why? He says it for your sake. Think about that. 
He did that for us. For your sake. And then it says, so that by his poverty, his poverty to the point of death on the cross, a sinner's cross, a criminal's cross. He took our place on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might receive the righteousness of God. By his poverty on the cross, we now have become rich. What do you mean rich? (laughs) We have the riches of heaven now. We have salvation and all the benefits that flow from it. We have forgiveness of sin. We have have the riches of his love. We have the riches of his peace and joy and hope and eternal life. We have the Holy Spirit in us. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that by his poverty you might become rich. I mean, if you have a pacemaker and it stops, that should get it started going again. Right there. It's an amazing passage. God did this as an act of grace. Romans 5, 8 reminds us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God shows his love for us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Here's the point. What Christ has done for us should be reflected in what we do for him and for others. And when you look at 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, you see generous giving as a response, as an overflow of those who've been impacted by the gospel. So here's a question. Do you truly comprehend what God has done for you? through his sacrifice on the cross, through his son's sacrifice on the cross for you, so you could have eternal life. When you do, it changes your perspective. And it changes the heart with which you give and serve and love and seek to expand the kingdom. So generosity is an act of grace. It's a response to the gospel. Third, generosity benefits all involved. And I kind of had to reach for this point, but it's actually there. Look at verse 10. And in this matter, I give my judgment. This benefits you. Who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. He's talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 through 4, when they started giving, then they stopped. There there were people that came into the church. There were Judaizers. There were false teachers that started to say Paul was in it for the money. But he says, this benefits you. But not only does it benefit to those that give, but it benefits those that receive. That's implied here. And that's why he says, generosity benefits all involved. Why then do we sometimes not do it? Why then do we sometimes not give? And, I'm, and I think we can see through this text some hindrances to generosity. Some hindrances to generosity. Let me put that up. The first one is procrastination. Procrastination, for those of you that don't know what it means, it involves intentionally or habitually putting off something that should be done. It's just not forgetting, but it's putting it off. You want to do it, but you're procrastinating. You know the favorite word of a procrastinator is? Tomorrow. But look at verse 11. So now finish doing it as well so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. I have to admit, I didn't share this with Pam, that last week, I'm not necessarily a procrastinator, but, you know, we, we have changes of seasons here. Like we have summer, which goes for a long time. 
we have winter, and sometimes we have a little bit of fall and a little bit of spring. Well, in the winter, we, we have some, like each year, we, we will buy like one or two of those outside heaters, and we'll like, so we can use them. And then in the summer, we, get, we put away the heaters, and we put out umbrellas. And so I was going to last, a week ago Saturday, get rid of the heaters and put up the umbrellas. And, I thought, and then I read the weather, and I thought, oh, it's supposed to be windy today. I'm not going to do that today. I'll do it tomorrow. And then Sunday comes, and I preach a message, and I'm like, it's Sunday afternoon. I'm not going to do this. I'll wait till tomorrow, my day off. And then I get to Monday, and it's like, I better do this, because it's not getting any cooler, and I don't need the heaters. And, and it's like, like I, I got to stop procrastinating. I'm going to get this done. And sometimes we just, we can procrastinate. But second, the second hindrance to generosity could be hesitation. Hesitation. And I talked about it a little bit earlier, but we could be like, when I have what I don't currently have, then I will. When, maybe when I have more money, when I get my finances in order, when I get a house, when I get a car, when I fill in the blank. When I, when I. Paul deals with this. He responds to their excuses in verse 11, 12. Follow the thinking. So now finish doing it as well so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. He goes on. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable. It is acceptable according to God. It is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Hindrances. Procrastination. Hesitation. And the third could be, well, I'm the exception. I'm the exception. We could think, since others are better off financially than me, they can do it. I'm the exception. This is why it's so important. It's, again, it's a hard thing. It's, it's not a money thing. It's a, it's a hard thing. Are we serving the, the advancement of the kingdom? Verse 13. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burden, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply the need so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. He's just, he wants us to be involved. And then he, in verse 15, he, he quotes from Exodus chapter 16, verse 18, where he says, as it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. And it's speaking of when the nation was walking in the, in the wilderness, the nation of Israel, and he provided manna. They would gather up enough for each day. They wouldn't have too much left over. And, and they, they, they would, everybody had what they needed. So we see, we see here that generosity, it benefits all who are involved and those who receive it. But we can't allow hindrances to keep us from being blessed. All right. Finally, the end of this passage, Paul gives some wisdom for handling the gifts. And I think this is, I, I read this, I said, what do I do with this? But I think it's a good reminder. He gives wisdom for handling the gifts because this, this gift has to be collected and then it has to be taken to Jerusalem. And, and that's a long trip. And so he gives wisdom for handling the gifts in a God honoring way. First thing he says is use qualified people. Use qualified people. And he says, you know, godly character is the key. He looks for character over gifts. So Paul mentions at least three qualified men, Titus and two unnamed men, who were, to be who were tested. Let me just, just follow along in verse 16. But thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care I have for you. So Titus has this care for them that Paul did. He says, for he not only accepted our appeal, but... Being himself very earnest, he is going to you of his own accord. With him, we are sending, here's the second guy, the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. Now, he doesn't name who that brother is. They all knew we don't need to know. Here was a guy that was appointed by the other churches. He was known for preaching the gospel. And he says, not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our goodwill. So you've got Titus that's going, this brother that's been appointed, who's a gospel preacher. We don't know who that is. Verse 20, 
We take this course so that no one should blame us about this generous gift that is being administered by us. You know, Paul was putting things in place to make sure that no one could say, you're abusing the gifts. And that would be a horrific thing to have happen. For we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, so like we, we're accountable to the Lord, but also in the sight of man. And so I'm going to talk about what we do with the gifts that come in here. And we just know this. We, we know we're accountable to God first and foremost, but also to you and to those outside. And with them, we are sending our brother. This is a third guy whom we have often tested and found earnest in many manners, uh, but who is now more earnest than ever because his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker for your benefit. And as for our brothers, these two other guys, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. So give proof before the churches of your love and of your boasting about you to these men. There's some characteristics we see of these people that handle the gifts, the credentials. We see that they're earnest, verse 16. We see it again in verse 20, uh, 22, I believe it is. They're willing. They do it of their own accord. Uh, 19, verse 19, they've been appointed by the church. 22, they've been tested. In 23, they're, they're glorifying Christ. They're cooperative. I think those are all really important qualifications. But not only do we use qualified people, but we must in, administrate the gifts honestly and openly. Administrate the gifts honestly and openly. Now, so this is where I'm going to get pretty practical. We have a treasurer. And, and our treasurer, he's a CPA. He's an attorney. He's a wealth management advisor. He's tested. He's greatly trusted by our elders and our deacons. And he's got kind of overview of that, of our, of our gifts. Now, 85% of our gifts come online, which we appreciate. Systematic giving online. Um, the rest of the gifts are generally dropped into the black boxes around the church. What we do then is at the end of the services, they're, they're, they're picked up. They're counted by at least two people, generally one elder and one deacon. A giving slip is recorded. It's signed by those who do the count. And then it's deposited in the bank. And that, and that is sent to our bookkeeper, who then records all that. Now, regarding our banking, our bookkeeper does the bank reconciliations. Now, Johannes has, as our director of ministry operations, has access to review the deposits and the checks in the account. So we have all these redundancies to protect. Prior to that, we have a very significant budgeting process, which Johannes puts together in cooperation with the staff, which the elders then must approve. And so once uh, uh, at the end of a period, we produce financials, we compare them against what was budgeted so that each ministry can be tracked. Why do we do all this? Because it's important to us, because we're stewards of your gifts. You've given these gifts sacrificially, willingly, systematically, generously. We're thankful for that. And we know we're accountable to the Lord. And we know that they're there to advance the kingdom. We know that your generosity is an act of grace that is in response to the gospel. So we take these precautions so no one can question how we're handling these gifts. I've never talked about this with the church. I think it's important that I do. So that's why we're doing it right now. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Your giving is an act of love that helps to advance the gospel. They help to fulfill our mission and vision, our mission to glorify God through the fulfillment of the Great Commission. What's the Great Commission? To go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you, and, lo, I will be with you even to the end of the age. Our mission is all about sharing the gospel. It's about teaching. It's discipling. It's about seeing people baptized. Our, our, our vision, 
where we want to see ourselves, it's to see lost people saved, saved people mature, mature people multiplied to the glory of God. And I believe we are on track to fulfill that mission that God has called us to. In fact, since the end of November, we've, we've had 29 baptisms. We continue to support the work in Cluj, Romania, Dea Gloria, the church that we planted three years ago. When there was a need, we, we raised uh, $100,000 for a refugee center for those coming out of, of the war in Ukraine. Uh, the church in, in, in Dea Gloria now has three pastoral residents. One hopefully is going to go to Germany and plant. One is hopefully going to go to Timisoara in Romania. And then another one will go to Cluj and plant. Advancing the gospel. We help train and educate future leaders. We have two Malawi students that are Master of Divinity students that at, at GCU that we help to underwrite. We have a pastoral resident. We have interns. We provide scholarships for the youth camp. Thank you for those that have, that have already helped with that. Um, all this helps to fulfill our mission and vision. In addition to that, the baby bottle drive, we, we help support ministries like Red Light Rebellion. We put on date night to help strengthen your, uh, your, your marriages. We had the marriage conference. All of this as a result of generous giving. We even sometimes have to take care of this building. You don't, I, you don't know this, but we just recently re-roofed this building. Doesn't that look beautiful? <laughs> it was a mess. And you know, we saved the way we did it. Thank you, Lewis. We saved like $50,000. Now, that right there's got to get fixed. I, I remember when I was watching Dave Harvey do the marriage conference, and I'm looking up there, and I'm thinking, we've got a bad projector. I mean, we've like this. Thing. And so we're, we're right now considering, you know, thinking wisdom-wise long-term, maybe like a bigger one of these up there so that, like, you can see, and you don't, like, you don't have to do this. At the end of the day, Generosity is motivated by the gospel. Are you generous? Is your understanding of the gospel motivated by what Christ has done for you on the cross? Is your giving systematic, proportionate, Generous, sacrificial, joyful? Or are you hindered by procrastination, hesitation, thinking that I'm the exception? At the end of the day, it's not about the money. But it is about the money. It's about the heart. Get the heart right, everything else falls in place. I'm going to ask our worship team to come up. And I want us just to reflect in our song of response on the grace of Christ. God's amazing grace who was rich but became poor so that by his poverty we might become rich. Father, we thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today that has never turn from their sin and turn from themselves and turn to you out of faith that today would be the day of their salvation. Father, I just ask that, uh, yeah, I, I just ask that um, we would give ourselves first to you and then to the ministry you've, you've called us to, at this place called Hope. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your amazing grace. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.